Well, we're going to be spending a lot of time in the book of Psalms this morning. And before I even get started with preaching, I kind of want to explain a little bit why I'm preaching on the subject I'm preaching on today. Um, some of you probably already have an idea anyways as it is. But, um, you know, there's a few things I like to do as a preacher or try to do as a preacher. And just so you understand where I'm coming from, you know, I, I think my job as a preacher is to, try, is to preach the whole counsel of God, first Amen. and foremost. Everything that the Bible says, unapologetically, to preach what it says. It's not my word, it's God's word. I also try to preach on subjects that, you know, if we see a frequency in the Bible, some things popping up more often than other times, I try to maintain that level of, of uh, you know, topics and subjects that come up. Obviously, no one's perfect with that, I, I, but that's that's one of the things that I think about when I prepare sermons, when I think about what am I going to teach, what am I going to preach on. I try to look at what comes up most frequently in the Bible, but there is an exception to that. There are some areas where certain subjects need to be preached on more frequently or more prevalently because there's problems in our society or in the church or among Christianity or whatever that need to be addressed. And they kind of just need to be brought to the forefront a little bit more frequently because it's a problem. When things really aren't that much of a problem, you're probably not going to hear a whole lot about that. I mean, if everybody's got that, it's, that's why when we preach, I don't preach a salvation message, for example, every single service. Because the church is supposed to be geared for saved people. You already heard the gospel. You know the gospel. You believe the gospel. You got that settled. Right? Right. That part's taken care of. Let's learn, let's think about some new things, let's keep moving forward. Now, what I'm preaching on today, you know, I also like to preach on things that are timely. So, on Mother's Day, I preach a Mother's Day sermon. Next week is Father's Day, I preach a Father's Day sermon. Just because it's on a lot of people's minds and there's a lot of good teaching that goes along with that. Well, this month, of course, is the, the homo sodomite pride month and week and everything that's that's coming up so if you've noticed on social media and even just on billboards or just in, in other places there's this marketing and this advertising of the rainbow and the rainbow flag and things like that trying to show support i mean even the president of the united states tweeted out his stupid wicked message of his desire to essentially promote filth in the entire world. That's right. Because there are areas, there are countries, there are parts of this world <laughs> that view sodomy as an abomination and as something that's a crime and something that's worthy of a punishment. But the president wants to know we, we need to work hard and make it our agenda to, to make sure that, that it's not a crime and it's not treated as such throughout the world and just completely disregard the word of God and what God's judgment is on that crime. And yeah, you know what? I'm going to call it a crime because that's what it is. It's not just a sin. It's a crime. Crimes in the Bible come with punishment. You can read through the Old Testament law and you're going to find a lot of, of laws that are punishable by a particular punishment, by a judgment. So there's many things that are sin in Scripture, but not all sin was actually incorporated into human government, or at least the way that God's design was to have it part of human government. For example, you know, the Bible says not to hate your brother without a cause. That's a sin. But there's no law that God has given saying, well, if somebody does that, then you need to give them, you know, a beating or whatever. But there is judgments against people who steal, people who murder, you know, people who do all manner of other things, typically against somebody else. It's a violation. And when an act of sodomy is committed, that is a violation. It's a violation against the other person, whether they, whether they want to do it or not. Because it's also a violation against the way that God created mankind naturally. And, and it is sick, disgusting, perverted, and it is a crime. Right. And that's the way that the Bible defines it. It's listed in crime. So 
It's not just a lifestyle. It's not just a preference. It's not just a choice. It's not just, well, you don't have to worry about what people do behind their closed doors. But you know what? If, if it comes to crimes that God outlaws, then you know I would be worried about it. I mean, if you use that same logic, well, what about, what about the, the man who has his own son and then is defiling his son? Well, you don't have to worry about what he does in his bedroom with his son. Well, yeah, you know what? We do have to worry about that's right. that. Because that's disgusting and he needs to be put to death. And that's the way that the law ought to work. So, yeah, you know what? There are areas where, where we need to be concerned about what's going on. It's not that I want to know what they're doing in there, but it's that when crimes are being committed, we ought to have laws that deal with it as such. And that's why I'm going to preach, and that's why I'm going to teach. And when you get the world's view just crammed down your throat over and over again, and this agenda is just continuing to be pushed ad nauseum, right. it forces the man of God to try to preach against it and to counteract that and to balance it out so that you don't just get this one-sidedness from the world that's going to desensitize you and, and soften you up to that sin. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't like preaching about the faggots. I don't like it. It's not fun. Right. This, isn't, this isn't something that's cool to me. I'd rather not have to deal with it at all because it's disgusting. It's disturbing. You read the stories in the Bible and it, tur it turns my stomach reading those stories. You read Genesis 19, you read Judges 19, it's not something that's one to deal with at all. I'd much rather just talk about soul winning. I'd much rather just talk about other areas of a Christian life. But this has to be dealt with, and I'm going to deal with it, yes, again, this morning. Amen. And I want to make sure we have a right mindset when it comes to dealing with this. Psalm 15 is where we started. Verse number one, this is a psalm, the psalmist here is asking, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Amen. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And then we're going to get the answers. So, it seems pretty simplistic. Yeah, I want to abide in God's tabernacle. I want to be with God in God's house, in God's tabernacle. I want to abide, not just show up and leave. I want to stay there. I want to be in God's house. I want to dwell in God's holy hill. Well, who is that going to be? Well, he starts off in verse 2. He that walketh uprightly. That's a pretty good start. Right? Look at God's word. Walk uprightly. Do what the Bible says. Work righteousness. That's Hey, that's these are things that are going to help you to abide in God's tabernacle. And speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. So those were the positive things. Verse number two. Hey, do what's right. Do good things. Work righteousness. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. Don't be talking bad about other people. Talk about people behind their back. Making up lies. Making railing accusations or whatever. Just causing drama. Causing discord among brethren. We don't need to be doing that. Nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Are you going to be doing evil or harm and harming your neighbor? Obviously... That's not going to help you stay in God's tabernacle, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So here we have, basically, what the Bible teaches, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Another concept that people seem to not have much of a problem with, good teaching. But look, the very next verse, the very next verse, see, people are okay with Psalm 15 when you read verses 1, 2, and 3. But all of a sudden, you know, you got to keep going to verse number 4. Verse number four says, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. That word contempt, if you think of the word contempt, if you have contempt for someone, you disdain that person, you, you hate that person, right? That, that is what that word means. So it says, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt changeth not. So a person that, they honor the people, the, the, the people of God. The people want to serve God, do righteousness, do good things. He's going to place them in higher regard. They're going to esteem them and honor them and um, have respect for them. But the, the vile person, they are contempt. All of these things are listed as who shall abide in thy tabernacle. Maybe you're doing good. 
in working righteousness. Maybe you're good, doing good in speaking the truth in your heart. Maybe you're doing good in backbiting, not with your tongue. But we live in a day and age where people have been taught that hate is just always bad and you cannot, you should not ever hate anyone at all for any reason. And that's false. Now, overwhelmingly, is the message you know, throughout Scripture have more to do with, with mercy and long-suffering and kindness and, and everything like that? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like having to preach on this subject very much because I don't want to get out of balance. But we just keep hearing the nonsense from the other side so much of this tolerance and acceptance and you need to love. And no, we don't. Because there are people who are vile that ought to be contemned in our eyes. There are vile people. Now, we're going to go through some Bible verses that talk about, just use that word, vile. Because that word vile just means, like, utterly disgusting. Right. Gross. Just, just wicked, vile, refuse. Ugh. So if we want to understand what the Bible's talking about, well, what type of person is a vile person, why don't we look at other references to the word vile in Scripture? Yeah. That kind of makes sense, because you know what? It isn't even really used that often. Yeah. Well, guess one of, the, one of the first places we see the word mentioned is in Judges 19. Judges 19. We just went through that in the Bible study. If you weren't here for that, Judges 19 is a story where the sons of Belial... The sodomites surround the man's house that took in strangers that were just passing through, and they wanted to sodomize the man that was in the house. Just identical to the story in Genesis 19, where the angels came into Lot's house, and the sodomites wanted to do the exact same thing to him. Now, one more point. When you read these stories in the Bible... You don't ever see any other type of story than those stories in reference to sodomites. But you know, if you don't know what that is, it's a homosexual, right. a queer, whatever name you want to put on them, whatever whatever you want to label that that group as, those people as. That is what you get from there. You never get anything else other than that in scripture. Right. Judges 19 verse 24. This is where the man is pleading with the people around his house to not sodomize the man that was brought into his house. He says, Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now and humble you them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. The act of doing that is vile. The people who would do such a thing are vile people. Amen. Psalm 15 says, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. We can look at 1 Samuel 3.13. This is talking about um, Eli's sons that were committing fornication and they were stealing the, the offering unto the Lord and they are doing all these things. They were false prophets. They didn't know God. They were reprobates. They were reprobates. They rejected the Lord. 1 Samuel 3.13 says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. There's another usage of that word vile, and guess what? It's talking about reprobates. People who have been rejected, given over to a reprobate mind. That's what reprobate means. We're going to get into that in just a few minutes. So if you're not sure what that term means, stick with us. Isaiah 32, verse number 5 and 6, the Bible says, The vile person. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. As I'm reading from Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32, verse number 5. The vile person shall be no more called liberal, nor the churl said to be bountiful. For the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy and to utter error against the Lord. To make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. So this is referring to a vile person. It says they speak villainy. Their heart is set to work iniquity. They practice it. They're a bunch of hypocrites. 
They're, um, they're set on their sin. They utter error against the Lord. And it says they make empty the soul of the hungry. So if someone comes to them and they're, and they're hungry, they don't give them anything. They make, they make it empty. You know, they make their stomach empty. They, they provide them nothing. Because they make empty the soul of the hungry. And he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. That's a pretty wicked person. If someone comes to you, you know, hungry or thirsty, nope. Yeah. And just withholding. And not just for their flesh, it says the empty, the, you know, the soul of the hungry. No, uh, no goodness in him. That's the vile person. That's what's being described. We're looking for, for how does the, the Bible use the word vile? Well, it reserves that word for, for pretty bad people. Really bad people. This isn't average unsaved Joe down the street. Because not everyone who's unsaved is just vile, according to the Bible's definition of vile. If it were possible, I would do it. But it's not possible. And God makes a distinction between the unsaved person and the vile person who is reprobate. Romans chapter 1 is going to explain a little bit more. So we're going to read this. And I know many of you are familiar with this doctrine, but some of you may not be. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time showing this from Scripture. In Romans chapter number 1. Because we're going to see basically the same exact definition and usage of the word vile in Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 21. That's where we're going to start our reading. And if you want to later on, I encourage you to read the entire chapter in context. And go ahead and read chapter 2 and read the whole book of Romans. <laughs> I don't want you walking away from here thinking, oh, man, the person just ripped something out of context. Go ahead and read it. Amen. Please do. Check me on this and see if, if what I'm explaining is right or wrong because that's your job. Verse number 21, the Bible says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is referring to a people that knew God. It doesn't mean they believed on God. It doesn't mean they accepted God. They just knew him. They were informed about God. They had heard about God. They had heard about the Lord. They knew him, but they glorified him not as God. Said, nope. What does that mean? I'm not going to believe on him. I'm rejecting that. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So what they do is, now, this is referring to idolatry. And what is an idol other than you making up your own God? Right. And when people reject the God of the Bible, the God of the Holy Scriptures, this, is, this contains who God is. Amen. And when you hear that and you reject that and you just say, no, I think God is whatever. A false god that's an idol well i think god would be like this and i think god you're forming and fashioning your own god because yep. you have no other reason to believe that other than just what i think see what we believe about god comes from god's own words he tells us who he is we don't form and fashion god to fit our image or to fit whatever image of god we think he should be we make our image of God formed and fashioned to what his word says. Because that's who God is. So these people, they knew God, but they said, you know what, I don't want anything to do with that God. So they make their own God. And choose to worship God. It says, verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So wherefore means for this reason. For this cause. Because they knew God, because they rejected God, because they just wanted to make up their own gods, God in turn gave them up to uncleanness. 
He allowed them. Okay, here we go. I'm giving up. Go ahead. Uncleanness. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. These people, you know, they changed the truth of God into a lie. And basically blaspheme God. They worship and serve the creature more than the creator. So the animals, mankind, whatever it is that they end up worshiping, uh, they worship more than the actual creator of those things. Verse 26, again, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust one toward another, Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So that verse 28 that we just read there, it says they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. They made up their own gods. They don't even want to think about the God of the Bible. They have nothing to do with the God of the Bible. And it says... Just like they don't want to have anything to do with God, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That word reprobate literally just means rejection. Because when God has given up on you, when God has just given you over to this stuff, then you're rejected. And just so we're very clear on this. I'm not saying that someone who commits a, a sodomite act or homosexual act is re is rejected because they committed that act. Right. Um, it's not what I'm teaching. And it's not what the Bible's saying here either. Right. It's saying that they knew God, they glorified him out of God. They became vain. They made up their own gods. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. So as a result, God rejects them. That's what happens first. That happens first. Because people are not born interested in the same gender. Right. In the same sense. That's not the way God made mankind at all. Amen. Mankind, womankind, you do not have a desire for the same gender from birth. Nobody does ever. Because if they did, then the Bible can't say that they left the natural use. Or it says... Uh, it says, for even the women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. Yeah. Because God's the one who gave us the nature that we have. God gave us the, the natural inclination to be with another person. God has instilled that in us from his creation. That's what's natural. God didn't screw up there. It's not until somebody rejects God. Then they're given over to that reprobate mind to do these types of things. Because normally and naturally, this behavior is repulsive. It turns the stomach. As I mentioned before, this is not something I like to have to deal with because it's disgusting. Even the thought of it is not something that's, that you want to have in your mind at all because it's repulsive. But for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. That's what the Bible says in verse 26. Those affections, men with men, women with women, are vile. Those are vile affections. And what did Psalm 15 say? In whose eyes a vile person is condemned. Now, one more point in Psalm 15, 4. It says, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. Because the other thing we have going on these days are people quoting Gandhi and saying that, well, you need to hate the sin and love the sinner. Well, in many cases, that's true. But that's not in all cases because we see here in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. It doesn't say in whose eyes the vile acts that a person does are contempt. It says, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. And when God has gone so far as to give up on someone and to just give them over to this vile, base affections that are unnatural, what can I do to 
bring him back. What can I do? If God's already rejected him, if God's given someone over to a reprobate mind, their mind has been rejected. How am I going to pierce through that mind if God has rejected it? God has hardened their heart. God has darkened them. They cannot believe. That's what the Bible says in the book of John. Therefore, they could not believe. There are people out there that literally cannot put their faith in Jesus Christ. Because it's too late for them. Because they've already rejected God and he's already rejected them. And, and the way to, to, to best understand this is there's a point for everybody where a person can become reprobate. Every unsaved person, there is a point where you can become reprobate. For most people, it's death. Because once you die, there's no more chances. There's no more hope. You don't have a second chance. You're not going to hear more preaching. You're not going to be like, oh, wait, no, I changed my mind. It's not the way it works. But what the scripture is also telling us here is that there is a point prior to death where some people are already just rejected. And they're already held bound. And I don't have this in my notes, but you can read Jude, you can read um, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, you can read places that talk about the false prophets, these reprobates. It's the same class of people. So, not every reprobate will go down that path of becoming a sodomite. But there is no reprobate that can ever be saved. Because they're rejected. Basically, what happens is that God just removes the conscience and the reins that, have, that are naturally on us, when a person just becomes rejected, he says, okay, now you're like an animal. Right. And they're just going to do the lusts of their own heart. And whatever that lead, whatever path that leads them down is, is where they'll go. Turn, if you would, please, to... 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start reading verse number 14, but what we see happening is we see what the scripture says. The scripture explains what a reprobate is. It's, the scripture explains how people even become sodomites that, that normal people can't even fathom. How would you ever want to do that? That's why the rationalization of people is, well, they must have just been born that way because I have no idea how you can become that. And without scripture to guide us, that might make sense. Without the belief in the Lord of the Bible, you might be like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's pretty off the wall. That's pretty weird. They must have just been born that way. Right. But the Bible tells us how, the, how it came to be. Amen. And how it came to be. So when you see that, when you see the, the, the sodomite, the men that burn in their lust one towards another, that just demonstrates that that person's already been given over to that. Yeah. That they've already been rejected. So we can't identify every reprobate because they don't all exhibit those traits. But the ones that do exhibit these traits, we know for sure are reprobate. Right. It's as simple as that. And the Bible tells us also not to be yoking up with wicked people. The Bible says uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Now, this starts off just saying unbelievers. I'm going to apply this even worse than unbelievers. Right? I'm, I'm going to apply this to reprobate. So, if this is true for unbelievers, how much more so for people who are God rejectors? that hate God, that have the attributes of Romans chapter 1, which I forgot we didn't read all the way through. You can read that through on your own time. 
read the rest of Romans 1, because I didn't even get into all of the attributes that, that go along with these people who were given over to this reprobate mind. It lists off, they're filled with all unrighteousness, all uncleanness, all, you know, read through that whole list for yourself, and you'll get a, a better picture of, of how God paints these people. So if this applies to unbelievers, how much more so the reprobate? Look what it says. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is the devil. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore... Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Any believer that would yoke up with the vilest, the vilest of people in this world are wicked, and they need to repent. Supporting, promoting the vile, endorsing instead of hating. That's how backwards things have become. You've got even, you know, so-called Christians out there. I saw, I saw on social media, you know, some church or whatever with some signs, oh, we're sorry. We're sorry, homo community. We're sorry, people who don't even have enough sense to know whether you're a male or female. We're sorry for being mean to you. Well, you know what? I'm not sorry. Amen. God says that in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. I'm going to hate him. I'm not going to love him. I'm not going to apologize to him. And, oh, Christianity's just been so... Oh, yeah, they've been so They've been so bad recently, right? There's, it's not even against the law anymore. I don't think anywhere in the United States. It used to be against the law, just never enforced. It used to be enforced way long time ago. But these days, it's just... Don't judge. <laughs> but let's look a little bit more. You say, Pastor Person, maybe you just don't understand Psalm 15. Well, let's look at more passages of Scripture. Look at Psalm 5. Turn to Psalm 5. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the Psalms. Psalms is a book that, I mean, I thought every Christian wants to turn to anyways. It's uplifting. It's going to give you guides, right? When, when you hear about Christians who don't just read their Bible regularly, like, oh, I just love going to the book of Psalms. Right, right, yeah. I just love the book of Psalms. Well, read it a little bit more carefully next time, really. Because usually it's the same people that just, Oh, the, you know, I just read the book of Psalms. It gets me through the week. I, you know, <gasps> you said you hated somebody. I thought you were reading Psalms. <laughs> and you know what the New Testament says? Speaking to each other in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So that is something for the New Testament. We don't just throw out any of the Old Testament. That's right. But written in the New Testament. Testament is a command to speak of yourself in psalms and in the spiritual psalms. Psalms. So we ought to be going to the psalms. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Yeah. Amen. Let's look at Psalm 5. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. This is all about God. God hates all, does, it, does it say God hates all iniquity? No, it says God hates all workers of iniquity. That's an important distinction. God doesn't hate everybody. Anybody, God is love. And you've got people, apologetic Christians out there saying, well, God doesn't hate you. I, 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 what was that guy's name? I don't even know who these people are. I'm glad I don't really know them. But apparently, I mean, there's people out there that have a lot of influence and a lot of followers and things like that. And they're saying, well, what would Jesus say to an LGBTQ plus person today? What would he say to, you know, these alphabet animals? <laughs> what would he say? <laughs> he would say, I love you. Really? Psalm 5 says, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Jump down to verse number 9. The Bible says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against thee. 
That is a righteous thought. That is a righteous prayer from someone who is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost saying, destroy them, God. They're God's enemies. It's not, you know, the Bible says love your enemies. Yeah, we love our enemies. It doesn't say to love God's enemies. Jehoshaphat was rebuked from the Lord for helping and assisting with God's enemies. He says, now wrath's going to come on you for helping the ungodly. There's a difference. There's a difference between your personal enemy and the enemies of the Lord. Destroy thou them, O God. That's someone speaking in the spirit of God. Look at Psalm 10. Psalm 10, verse number 2. The Bible says, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. There's that word pride. You can see a lot of pride and boasting also with wicked people in the scriptures. And I think it's just fitting that these sodomites have their great hope pride. Right. Right? What do you always see stamped with the rainbow flag? Pride, pride, pride. We're real proud. We're out and proud. We're proud. Yeah, I know you're a proud people because that's what God said you are. And you're just exposing who you really are. And any Christian that can't see that is dead and they're not reading their Bible. They need to get right, right with God and start reading the scripture and applying it appropriately. Amen. We have a whole group of people that is identified by pride. Right. Pride is a wicked sin. Yeah, Pride is of the devil. Right. That, is the, that is the sin that made Satan fall. Right. Psalm 2, or 10, verse 2. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the vices that they have imagined. Again, well, let them be taken in the vices. They're, they're trying to trick people and trap people and persecute people. Well, let them fall into their own destruction. Verse 3, for the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. What are they proud about? Their wickedness, their heart's desire, how much they love filth and, and vile affections. That's what they're doing in their parades. They're trying to tell you how proud they are of the fact that they're a pervert. Right. Yeah. That, they're, that they're completely unnatural, vile, and disgusting. And that's what we're all proud about. No, you have to accept me. You have to accept my perversion. They boast of his heart's desires as it blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Whom the Lord, not that the Lord, but whom. Person. Again, we see God hating someone. Hating who? The covetous. The wicked. Boasting of his heart's desire and they're blessing covetous people. Verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You want to meet, there is not a group of people more hostile towards Jesus Christ and the God of the Bible than the Sodomites. Don't believe me? I don't recommend this, but go ahead and go to one of these parades and try to talk to him about Jesus Christ. I mean, the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Like, yeah. bring the Bible with you and start trying to share some Bible verses with them. And you tell me if there are people that, oh, God's in all of their thoughts. They're seeking after God. No, they're not. They have nothing to do with them. Right. Because even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They don't want to hear about it. Right. They want to silence the Christian. They want to silence the word of God. They want to boast and glory in their own shame and force you to accept it. And they will not tolerate anything else. They're implacable, unmerciful, which is why they're going after Christians, why they're trying to shut down PayPal accounts, why they're trying to close funding. They want to censor and stop the word of God from being promoted because they can't stand to hear it. Right. Because they hate God. Right. And I hate them. Amen. Amen. Turn to Psalm 97. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Basically, don't let your love be fake. Don't let that be simulated. Don't, don't love certain things and not others. You have to love appropriately according to Scripture. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor 
that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Hate the evil and stick to the good. You cannot love something without hating something else. If you say you love everyone and you love everything, your love has dissimulation. It's fake. It's phony. Because it can't be true. You can't say you love children and child molesters at the same time. You can't. You can't say you love God and love the people that hate God. Psalm 9710, the Bible says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Yes, we need to hate. We need to hate evil. Look at Psalm 101. Look over to Psalm 101. You say, yeah, but you see there it just says evil. It doesn't say anything about a person. Well, look at Psalm 101. Verse number two, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. In a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So he's all about a perfect way, a perfect heart. How are we going to achieve this? Verse three, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside and shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. I will not know a wicked I want to have nothing to do with a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. I will not allow the proud look, the, the proud heart, the high look. Not going to allow it. Not going to tolerate it. Intolerable. <laughs> I'm not going to know the wicked person. Put him away from me. That's walking in a perfect way. That's walking with a perfect heart. Oh, it's not? Well, then I guess you don't believe that this is God's work. You just want to pick and choose and make you up your own idol. Of cherry picking verses out of scripture that you want to believe and not believing all of them. So, no, I believe all of them. Look at Psalm 26. Psalm 26, a psalm of David. I love this because I love the boldness that a man of God can have, speaking in the Spirit, speaking God's Word, having the boldness to say, Judge me, O Lord! That's pretty bold. Yeah. I don't know that I feel comfortable <laughs> saying that. But here we have, through the Holy Ghost, through the Spirit saying, Judge me, O Lord. For I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Again, very bold psalm. So when we get into what he's done and what he's doing, and he's saying, just, hey, try me out. When you don't see a refutation of that in the scripture, when you don't see from God's own word saying, well, no, I was wrong about this. Yeah, I have tried you, and this is where you're lacking. We don't see any of that. Then this is all being affirmed as being true. This is, yes, God's tried and proven, and this is right. Look at verse number three. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. The congregation. What, where are we at here? We have a congregation here right now. A congregation is also known as a church. That's another you know, synonym for it. But a congregation. Is the congregation the building? No. Congregation is the people. Right. It's a group of people, but it is people. So when he says, I've hated the congregation, 
of evildoers. This is evildoers joining up together and congregating and meeting and plotting and planning and doing wicked things. I hate them. That's what Try me, O oh Lord. Test my heart. Check me out. Am I righteous? I hate them. I've hated them. I don't see the Bible saying, no, you were wrong. You shouldn't have had that attitude. No, we're being taught that you can be this bold and have this attitude hating the congregation of the wicked. Psalm 139. The book of Psalms. The nice, uplifting Psalms. <laughs> Which you know, most of them are. Most of them are a lot of encouraging. But you know what a lot, what most of them are though too. It's it's you know trusting in the Lord. Why? Because you're being persecuted. Because you got people coming after you. Because you got people that hate God and and hate you and and they're trying to, to shut you down. So a lot of a lot of the Psalms are David going through a lot of that that turmoil and, and you know people after him and just you know the Lord is is a God in whom I put my trust. He's my butler. He's my shield. He's my rock. You know I, he's my high tower. You get a lot of that in the, in the book of Psalms, but it's, it's still a lot of comfort coming because of the persecution. See, unfortunately, I, I wish people could get this through their heads earlier. Unfortunately, I think people are just going to have to learn the hard way. Some people aren't going to get it until they surround the house and have the numbers like they did in Sodom. Like they did in those stories because they had a lot of wicked people there. See, when there's not as many of them, when they're not as out and proud and not as tolerant and not as accepted, there's not as much power and influence that they can do. But the more they accumulate and the more they go and the more they recruit to get people perverted like them, you're going to start seeing more of the true colors coming out. And unfortunately, it's going to be too late. When that starts to happen. Psalm 139, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. So again, this is talking about the enemies of God. People that hate God. They speak against God wickedly. Thine enemies take thy name in vain. Verse 21, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. There are quite a few verses. This isn't one isolated verse in Psalm 15 that talks about hating a vile person. And I'm not hitting all of them either, by the way. Do your own study. Because I hate them with a perfect hatred and I count them mine enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. There it is again. Search me, God. Am I wrong about this? Let me know. Try me. Judge me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How many times can a man of God ask God to judge him and then just not get an answer? You think that's going to be included in God's word? When he's saying, here's what I've done. Hey, God, I hate them. They hate you. I hate them with a perfect hatred. Try me. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, the proof of being in Scripture shows he's right. Amen. Amen. So the, the, the Christians that don't want to accept this, they're wrong. They're the ones that don't, that, they're the ones that are trying to be in God's place, judging, oh no, that's wrong. God already did the judging, he didn't say it was wrong. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, we're almost done. I'm going to read you from Philippians chapter 3, Philippians 3.18, the Bible says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. 
whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They glory in their shame. These enemies of God, these enemies of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction. Second Peter chapter 2, we're just going to see again a, a few more attributes of reprobates. That's what ultimately what we're dealing with here. But more specifically, I'm, I'm targeting the sodomites. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 12, the Bible reads, But these as natural brute beasts. Beasts, animals, made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. So these people are just like beasts made to be taken and destroyed. The, the rabid dog, you can't do it, you can't fix them. That's why you just put a bullet in their head and it's done. That beast is just, they're, they're gone, they're done. Put them out of their misery. And this is referring to people in verse 12. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things they understand not. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand God's word, yet they speak evil about it. Right. Yeah. They're going to talk all day long about how horrible God's word is. They're going to utterly perish in their own corruption. Verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Now, how is it that they, they kind of pleasure to riot in the daytime? Because they have no shame at all. Normally, when you do something, riot's not a good thing. It's not good to riot. Right? So, so if people go into an excess of riot, they're unruly, that would be a shame. So any normal person who, who just gets out of hand and gets all drunk and gets all whatever, that's going to be shameful. You're going to want to, you're going to be embarrassed. You're going to want to kind of hide that, cover that up. Yeah, I, I, man, I can't believe I did that in broad daylight. These people say it's a pleasure to ride in the daytime because they don't care who sees them. They're proud of it. They're proud of their filthiness. They're proud of their perversion. They're proud of whatever it is that they do that's against God. They're proud of it. There is no conscience. There is no shame. They don't care. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery. And that cannot cease from sin. These are the people we're talking about. There's a big difference between your average unsafe person and people who just cannot cease from sin. Their eyes are just full of adultery. Their heart is that wicked that they just cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. The sodomite goes after the children, by the way. Right. Talk about an unstable soul. They're pedophiles. Yep. They go after the kids to recruit them and to groom them and to make them become a reprobate too. Yeah. They're definitely not reproducing themselves. They're going after the unstable souls. And heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. They're cursed. There's no hope for them. It's a sad state of affairs, but it is what it is. And you either accept it or not. Accept what the scripture says or fool yourselves. Right. The Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The Bible says that God's, you know, God's law, it's perfect, it's great, it, it's what we should be meditating on, meditating on thy law day and night. You know what? Walking in righteousness, like Psalm 15 says, that's how you abide God's in God's tabernacle, well, how are you going to know what's right, what's righteous, if you don't know God's law? Because God's law is what tells us right from wrong. You have to know God's law. And in God's perfect, God's righteous law, he tells us that committing sodomy, men with men, is an abomination and it's a crime. Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon 